My name is Michelle. Growing up, the difference between my twin sister Linda and me was like night and day. She was the golden girl, and I was not. Our dad, a strict university professor, was always buried in books and lectures, while our mom was the perfect housewife, focused on home and family, urging us to follow her example. From as early as I can remember, being at home felt like sitting through a never-ending critique session. My parents had a plan for the perfect family, and it did not include a daughter who wore band t-shirts and liked to keep to herself. Michelle, why can't you be more like your sister? Was my mom's favorite line, usually directed at me when I showed up at breakfast with my headphones on, trying to shut out the world. Linda, on the other hand, basked in the glow of approval. I just don't get why it's so hard for you to put on a nice dress and smile more, she'd say, flipping her perfect hair over her shoulder. It felt like she was from a different planet. One particularly tough Saturday, as our family got ready for one of Dad's faculty parties, a total bore, but a mandatory event for us, I decided to rebel in the smallest way I knew how. I put on my darkest eyeliner and a pair of boots that definitely did not meet the acceptable standard. You're not going out like that, are you? Mom caught me on the stairs, her eyes glaring at my boots as if they were dirty. I shrugged my usual defense. Don't see why not. She sighed, that long, drawn-out kind that said I was the biggest disappointment in her perfectly organized world. Please, Michelle, just this once, can't you try to fit in? What for? So you can pretend we're the perfect family? I shot back, tired of the same old argument. It's not about pretending. It's about showing respect for your father, she argued, her voice taking on that sharp tone that meant business. Linda, overhearing the exchange came trotting down the hallway, her heels clicking on the hardwood floor like a judge approaching the bench. Mom's right, Amy, it's not that hard to look decent. Why do you always have to make things difficult? I don't want to be a clone of you, Linda, I snapped, feeling my face get hot. I hated these arguments, hated being compared, but more than anything, I hated feeling like the odd one out in my own home. Dad appeared at the bottom of the stairs, his brow furrowed. Michelle, go change now. We're leaving in 15 minutes, he said firmly. His tone left no room for argument. He didn't yell. He didn't need to. The disappointment in his eyes was enough to send me marching back to my room to swap my boots for plain flats and wipe away half my highliner. As we drove to the party, the car was silent except for the classical music Dad insisted on playing because it was calming. I stared out the window, watching the trees blur past. In that moment, I promised myself that someday I'd live a life where no one could tell me what to wear, how to act, or who to be. Someday, I'd be free from these expectations. My room was the only corner of the house where I could pretend I was somewhere else, anywhere else. Unlike the rest of the house, which was filled with my parents' choices, my room was mine. It wasn't much, just three walls covered in sketches and music posters, but it was my escape from the reality of my family's expectations. One evening, as I was trying to lose myself in a playlist of my favorite bands, Dad knocked and marched into my room, his face set in a familiar frown. Michelle, turn that noise down. And why haven't you studied with Linda today? You know you both have exams coming up, he said, his voice stern. I pulled out one earbud and looked up at him, trying to keep my voice calm. I've been studying, just not with Linda. I learn better on my own. Dad shook his head, clearly not believing me. You know the rules. Your sister gets good grades, and you should be doing the same. I don't see why you always have to make things difficult. It's not about making things difficult, I said, feeling my frustration grow. I just don't see why I have to do everything Linda's way. Can't I have my own way of studying? He didn't respond to that, just switched to another complaint. And those friends of yours, I saw you with them at the cafe yesterday. I don't think they're a good influence. You should be spending time with the daughters of my colleagues. They're more suitable. I felt my temper rising. Suitable for what? For you? Because they talk about economics and pretend to enjoy those boring university gatherings. 
Before he could answer, Mom appeared at the doorway, her voice sharp. Michelle, your father is right. Those girls are from good families. They know how to behave. They're the kind of friends you should want. I stood up, facing both of them. What if I don't want friends who are picked for me? What if I want to choose my own friends, choose what I study, or even decide what I want to be? That's enough, Michelle, Mom said firmly. You know your future is with the university. Your father has made sure of that. And after you graduate, you'll need to start thinking about settling down. We've already discussed this. Settling down. The words felt like a prison sentence. You mean thinking about being someone's wife, like Linda? Is that all you think I've meant for? Mom's face softened a bit, but her voice stayed firm. We want what's best for you. Following the path we've set out will give you a good life. A good life, I repeated, the irony bitter in my mouth. Is it a good life if it's someone else's idea of good? No one answered. They didn't need to. We all knew there was no point in arguing. They had their plans, and they expected me to follow them, just like Linda. Linda and I were like two sides of the same coin, always together but never on the same page. At the university where Dad taught, the differences between us became even clearer. She was into business management, the golden child always nodding along in lectures and asking smart questions that made the professors smile. Me, I was stuck in the same program, but it felt like wearing the shoe on the wrong foot awkward, uncomfortable, and just plain wrong. One afternoon, as I was struggling through a pile of textbooks in the library, Linda breezed in, her notes organized, her smile ready. Hey, Amy, you coming to the study group tonight? Professor Hall mentioned he might drop by. It could be good for us to show up, she said, her tone light but insistent. I glanced up, feeling the weight of her expectations. No, I don't think so. Those things aren't really my scene, you know. She frowned, putting her books down with a thud that matched her disapproval. It's not about it being your scene, Amy. It's about making the right impressions. You need to start taking this seriously. We're graduating soon. I shrugged and turned back to my notes. I am taking it seriously, just not in a way that makes me unhappy. Why should I pretend? Because, Amy, sometimes you have to play the game to get ahead, she said, waving at her neat textbooks and color-coded notes. It's not about liking it. It's about doing what's necessary. I shook my head and pushed my chair back with a scrape. Well, maybe I'm tired of doing what's necessary according to everyone else. Did you ever think of that? Her voice softened, but her eyes were still firm. Amy, I'm just trying to help you. Dad won't always be around to fix things. What will you do if you keep pushing everyone away? Maybe I'll figure it out on my own. Maybe I don't need to follow Dad's path or yours, I replied, feeling a surge of defiance. Linda sighed, clearly frustrated. You're so stubborn. Just try, okay. For me, if not for yourself, show up tonight and talk to Professor Hall. It won't kill you. I looked at her, really looked, and saw not just my perfect sister, but someone who cared in her own way. Fine, I'll think about it. I conceived, not ready to promise more. Thank you, she said, her smile returning. It's not that bad, you know. You might even like it if you gave it a chance. Doubt it, I muttered, but I knew I had lost this round. For Linda, I'd show up, sit through another boring discussion, and not at the right times. It was just a few hours. How bad could it be? As it turned out, not as bad as I thought. Professor Hall was surprisingly interesting when he wasn't lecturing from a podium. I even asked a question, which earned a shocked but pleased look from Linda. Later, as we walked back to our dorm, Linda nudged me. See, not so terrible, right? That fragile piece didn't last long. In our final year, Linda introduced us to her fiancé, a lawyer 12 years older, already well-established and exactly what our parents dreamed of. Mom and Dad were thrilled, praising Linda for making such a smart choice. Then they turned their hopeful eyes on me. Now, Michelle, it's your turn to find someone suitable, Dad said one evening over dinner, 
his tone implying my time was running out. Mom nodded enthusiastically, already planning out my life as if it were another one of her well-organized projects. Think about your future, dear, someone who can provide for you, who has a good standing. I remember staring at my plate, feeling trapped. Linda's wedding was planned down to the smallest detail by mom. From the bridesmaids' dresses to the flowers, everything showed off her perfect vision of family prestige. After the wedding, mom often visited Linda, giving advice and making sure Linda's life went exactly as she had planned. Watching this, I knew one thing for sure. I didn't want my life controlled by someone else. One day, I was walking down the street, lost in thoughts about escaping the life my parents wanted for me, when I heard the deep rumble of a motorcycle. Curiosity made me look. That's when I saw him Brian, with his leather jacket and carefree smile, pulling up beside me. You look like you need a ride, he called over the roar of the engine, a playful sparkle in his eyes. I hesitated, looking back toward the path home, then at his outstretched hand. What did I have to lose? Sure, why not? I said, my voice a mix of nerves and excitement. Climbing onto the back of his bike, I felt a rush of adrenaline as we sped away. The wind whipped through my hair, and for the first time in a long while, I laughed a real laugh. Brian shouted something about showing me his world, and I held on tighter, not wanting the moment to end. We stopped at a diner popular with bikers, over burgers and fries. Brian told me about his life as a welder, his love for bikes, and his passion for the open road. It was so different from anything I was used to raw and real. Don't you get scared living like this? I asked, my voice barely rising above the clatter of plates and chatter around us. Scared? No, it's thrilling. You never know what's around the corner. Isn't that better than having everything planned out for you? He replied, his eyes lighting up with each word. Over the next few weeks, we met in secret. Each ride on Brian's motorcycle took me further from the life I was supposed to live and closer to the life I wanted. The speed, the adventure, it wasn't just about the thrill. It was about feeling alive, feeling free. One evening, as we watched the sunset from a secluded overlook, Brian turned to me. Michelle, I don't just ride to escape. I ride to feel alive to make every moment count. With you, every moment feels like it's worth something. I leaned into him, my heart beating fast. I've never felt like this before. You make me feel free, Brian. He smiled, pulling me closer. Then let's not go back to just existing. Let's live. Five months with Brian felt like a lifetime of moments. I had always dreamed of the day he would propose under the stars with the gentle rumble of his bike in the background. My heart said yes before my mouth could form the word. It was perfect, except for one big problem, my parents. I was scared to introduce Brian to them. He was everything they disapproved of his rough edges, his wild spirit, his simple but happy life as a welder. But love gave me courage, and I decided it was time for them to know. The day I brought Brian home, he wore his usual leather vest, red t-shirt, ripped jeans, and a bandana. I loved that about him he was always himself. As we walked up the driveway, I could already feel the weight of my parents' judgment. When we stepped inside, Mom's face went pale at the sight of Brian, her eyes widening in shock. What in the world, Michelle? She gasped, her voice barely a whisper. Dad's reaction was harsher, his words sharp as knives. Who is this, and why is he dressed like a thug in our house? I took a deep breath to steady my nerves. Mom, Dad, this is Brian. He's the man I love. We're getting married. The silence was deafening. Then Dad turned to Brian, his tone full of disdain. Married? What do you do for a living, young man? What are your qualifications? Brian, bless him, didn't waver. I'm a welder. I took some specialized courses after high school. I work hard and make an honest living. The look on my parents' faces was a mix of horror and disbelief. Mom looked like she might faint. A hey, welder, Michelle, you can't be serious. Dad's voice rose, anger flaring. You expect us to bless this, to throw away your future for a welder. 
I felt my resolve harden. Yes, because he makes me happy. Isn't that what should matter? But the life you'll lead, mom started, her voice trembling. It will be the life I choose. I shot back, my own voice gaining strength. Dad shook his head, his decision clear. We cannot and will not support this. If you choose him, don't expect to be a part of this family. The finality in his tone broke my heart, but not my decision. Brian squeezed my hand, giving me the strength to face them. Then I choose Brian. I choose us. I choose my happiness. Mom's eyes filled with tears, and Dad's jaw clenched tight. If you walk out with him, don't bother coming back, Dad said, his voice cold. Walking away from my parents' house with Brian, my heart was a mess of emotions, pain, relief, excitement, and fear all mixed into one. The night air felt different, like each breath was a new beginning. I took a step further into a new life. We rode in silence for a while, the steady roar of the motorcycle beneath us. When we finally stopped at a small diner on the edge of town, Brian turned to me with a serious look. Are you sure about this, Michelle? I mean, really sure. There's no going back after tonight, he said, his eyes searching mine for any sign of doubt. I nodded, squeezing his hand tightly. I've never been more sure of anything. Being with you feels right. It feels like what I'm meant to do. He smiled that reckless, charming smile that had won me over the first day we met. All right then, let's do it. Let's start our life together. Inside the diner, we found a quiet booth in the corner. The waitress brought us two coffees without asking, and we sat there planning our next steps. So what's first? I asked, stirring cream into my coffee and watching it swirl. We'll need to find a place to stay, at least for a while, and maybe look for jobs. I have some buddies who can help us get started, Brian replied, sounding practical but hopeful. It's going to be tough, isn't it? I said, more as a statement than a question. The reality of what we were doing was starting to sink in. Brian reached across the table and covered my hand with his. It might be, but we'll handle it together. Tough is nothing new for either of us, right? I couldn't help but laugh a short, genuine burst of amusement. Right, together. We spent hours in that diner talking and planning. Every so often, Brian would mention an idea that sounded so wild and free that it made my heart jump. And maybe one day, we'll save enough to take that road trip across the country. Just you, me, and the open road. I like that, I said, allowing myself to dream bigger than I ever had. Riding back into the city, we began our search. The next few weeks were a blur of activity. We found a small apartment on the edge of town. It wasn't fancy, but it was ours. Brian found work at a local garage, and I picked up shifts at a nearby diner. Life was hard, but it was ours. We made do with what we had, and every night when we came home to each other, it felt like we had everything. Months later, we decided it was time to make it official and got married in a small, intimate ceremony. I held on to a small hope that my family would show up, that they would see how happy I was and let go of their prejudices. But the chairs we had reserved for them stayed empty, and no congratulatory messages came. Despite the sting of their absence, the day was perfect because it was ours. Over time, I grew very close to Brian's mom. She welcomed me with open arms, calling me her daughter and filling in the gaps left by my own family. Her warmth and acceptance helped heal some of the wounds left by my parents' rejection. Things finally started looking up for Brian and me. After he completed some additional training and became a certified underwater welder, his income shot up to $230,000 a year. That change made a huge difference. We managed to buy a townhouse in a nice area, the kind of place I had always dreamed about but never thought I'd actually live in. I started working as a dispatcher in Brian's company. It wasn't just a job. It felt like I was part of something important, supporting the man I loved and building our future together. On weekends, we escaped the city on his bike, roaring through winding roads and taking in the breathtaking views of nature. 
Those moments, with the wind in my hair and Brian's warmth against my back, were pure bliss. Living nearby, my mother-in-law became a frequent visitor. One afternoon, while Brian was tinkering in the garage and I was making coffee, she arrived looking a bit troubled. There's been some bad news, she said as she settled down at the kitchen table. Something about a professor at the university involved in a harassment scandal. My heart skipped a beat. Did they say who it was? I tried to keep my voice steady, dreading the answer. She shook her head. No, they didn't mention a name on the radio, but you know how these things go. It's probably all over the TV by now. Nodding, I turned on the television and tuned into the news. Sure enough, there was a report on the scandal. As I had feared, my father's face appeared on the screen. The anchor detailed the accusations against him, and I felt a cold wave of disbelief wash over me. Turning off the TV, I sat down heavily, trying to process the news. Brian came in, wiping his hands on a rag, and saw my face. What's wrong, babe? He asked, his brow furrowed in concern. I swallowed hard, my voice barely a whisper. It's my dad. He's been accused of harassing a student. Brian's expression grew serious for a moment before he came over and took my hand. I'm sorry, Michelle. That's tough news. How do you want to handle this? I shook my head, feeling unsure about everything. I don't know. I mean, what can I even do? We're not close anymore. He squeezed my hand, showing he understood. Whatever you need, I'm here for you. We don't have to figure it all out right now. I decided to wait and see how things unfolded before making any moves. Whatever decision I made, I knew Brian would be by my side, and that gave me the strength to face whatever came next. Life had been peaceful until that unexpected afternoon at work when a familiar car pulled into the parking lot. I hadn't seen my parents in a long time, and the sight of them stirred up a mix of emotions I thought I had put to rest. They both looked dramatically different. The scandal had taken its toll mom had lost a lot of weight and looked much older, while dad seemed broken, a shadow of the stern man he once was. My mother saw me and rushed over, arms open as if nothing had happened, as if years of distance and disapproval could be erased in an instant. But I couldn't embrace her, not now. Instead, I stepped back and took Brian's hand, drawing strength from his presence. Michelle, it was so hard to find you, Mom said, her voice cracking with emotion. Dad, always the blunt one, got straight to the point. His voice was harsh and bitter. I was accused unfairly, you know. I went to your sister's husband for help, but that leech wanted a fortune. Your sister sided with him, and now they've kicked us out. We need your help. I stared at them, disbelief and anger swirling inside me. Help? After all these years, you show up and demand help. We have nowhere else to go, Mom said desperately. They've disowned us too. We thought maybe we could stay with you. I almost laughed at the absurdity. Stay with me? After you disowned me, you made it clear I wasn't your daughter anymore. Dad's face turned red, his old temper flaring up. You owe us, Michelle, after all we've done for you. That's where you're wrong. I replied, feeling a newfound resolve. I cut them off, feeling Brian squeeze my hand for support. I don't owe you anything. You threw me out because I chose my happiness over your demands. And now you want to just move in and act like we're a family again? The situation was spiraling out of control, and I could see people watching, a small crowd beginning to form. Mom started to cry, her sobs loud and drawing even more attention. You're being ungrateful after everything we've done for you, she accused through her tears. I took a deep breath, my decision clear. No, Mom, I'm not ungrateful. I'm free and happy. You made your choices, and now you have to live with them. As we walked away, I heard my dad yelling, but Brian leaned over and quietly told the security team, don't let them come here again. The following months flew by, filled with love and peace. We welcomed a son a new beginning for our growing family. My parents never came back. That day in the parking lot was the last time I saw them.
While part of me grieved for what could have been, I knew I had made the right choice for myself and for my family.